folks. In today's video, I want to talk about Netflix's drifting home. I mean, how do you see this movie poster and not just start asking questions? Like, how did it get there? What's making it float? So why am I like this? So per usual, I want to consider some of the engineering aspects that would come up when we ask a building to take to the high seas. Now, of course, spoiler alert for the film, and let's get right into it. For some context, the plot of the movie centers on the relationship between some middle schoolers, a boy, Kosuke, and a girl, Natsume, who due to family circumstance grew up together in an old apartment building. In current day, with the building condemned and the suit being demolished, Natsume begins to spend time there as a way of recapturing a piece of her childhood that she holds dear. This apartment building serves as one of the few places of good memory and belonging that she didn't have before or after her time staying with Kosuke and his grandfather. And in fantastical fashion, while Natsume and some classmates are poking around the old place, a heavy rainstorm hits and suddenly the apartment building is uprooted and marooned out in a vast sea. Immediately I'm reminded of a cruise ship as a floating behemoth with balconies overlooking the empty seas, but obviously in quite opposite circumstances. No crowded buffets, smoky casinos, you know, fun stuff. Now as the kids scavenge the building, they're introduced to a mysterious character, Nobo, who is meant to symbolize the spirit of the building, and from here it becomes pretty evident that our setting is firmly within the realm of the fantasy, so I'll peter off the synopsis there and leave some interpretation for how the film carries forward because, in all fairness, it gets a little out there. While the movie doesn't lean into the realism of the floating apartment building, still the concept is obviously visually stunning, and in interviews with the creator, Hiroyasu Ishida, this visual was a huge piece of inspiration that drove the work. And it's not arbitrary either, the specific type of building used is called a Danchi apartment that was built in mass after the Second World War to combat housing shortages. A distinct feature of it is that many of the apartments are interconnected, being able to travel between rooms without going into the main hallway, and can even be connected vertically. As a nuclear family American, that's certainly a departure from the norm I grew up with. I, I even raise an eyebrow when I stay at hotels that have this sort of feature, even if the door locks. And I know, we're taking our sweet time in getting to the engineering of the floating structure, but if Ishida can take the time to create a 3D rendering of the Danshi to assist with design and animation, something I wish I afforded myself when I'm creating these videos, then I figure some greater background on what type of building we're talking about is well worth it. So the name Danchi translates to group land or communal. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, the designs were largely inspired by Soviet Khrushchevka public housing projects that emphasized efficiency in their construction. The structural system is generally a concrete load-bearing wall that allowed for the housing units to be quite regular without the interruptions of interior columns. Architecturally, this often appears quite brutalist in nature and without any insulation in the exterior walls, it is said to feel quite harsh in both summer and winter. Winter climates. These buildings, though, mostly constructed in mid-century, in line with building codes of the time, are now generally considered to be structurally inadequate, mostly from a seismic perspective as our understanding of seismic design has bloomed in the past few decades, and many apartments built in this manner have either been retrofitted or demolished and rebuilt to current standards. So with this movie, Ishida truly is speaking to a reality that a lot of people in Japan have experienced in the past few decades. It's a reality that centers around buildings and housing in the spaces they create. Having participated in the design and construction of residential buildings, this theme validates the importance of community that drives these kinds of projects, like the Danchi. And if you're interested in learning more about the building type and the history of its architecture, Tatiana Norose wrote a well-researched book for English-speaking audience that has some great graphics to help understand Japanese housing. And the features of this specific building type are borne out within Drifting Home, juxtaposing the communal living with the isolation of being adrift at sea, uh, properly representing the structural and architectural systems, which I will say is a low bar, but one that many works don't bother to clear. Uh, there's rebar, uh, concrete walls, like where they're supposed to be. Uh, paying that much attention to the structure within a film just isn't expected, uh, but it is appreciated. So on that note, let's look at how Drifting Home places this historic and relevant architecture in an unconventional setting and take that seriously for a moment. And we'll do that through two main questions. How would an apartment be ripped from the ground and can this fella also be a boat? 
So looking back on the pivotal moments when the rainstorm is starting to drop buckets, there's a lot going on. Natsume is hanging on to Kosuke by a thread, cracks are developing in the concrete perimeter walls, and with a final blanket of rain just as Kosuke's grip slips and the flood comes, the next thing we know, we're at sea. Or maybe the whole world is covered in dozens of meters of water. It's, it's not clear to us or the characters as to what exactly happened. One kid pokes his head underwater and we're shown what appears to be torn concrete. Uh, either way, Natsume and Kosuke's old home has been ripped from its foundation, anchoring it to the earth. So then, to think a little more about what type of foundation the Danchi has, what is the building being ripped from? Based on the incredibly brief bits of animation, it seems to be ripped pretty cleanly if we take some of the full structure animations literally. Now, without devolving the conversation into a dense lecture on foundation systems, soil mechanics, and things I spent several classes learning in university, I'll jump to describing two scenarios. The first of which is that the Danchi used a continuous footing foundation that was ripped at the ground elevation when the flood came. This foundation type takes heavy loads that come down along the load-bearing concrete walls mentioned before and are buried below the more easily disturbed topsoil to spread out the loads in a more even fashion to the subsurface soils that aren't as strong as something like concrete. So for these to be ripped up, the entire perimeter of the building, as well as any continuous foundations within the interior of the structure, would need to either fail the concrete intention from the uplift caused by buoyancy, or the soil would need to fail. And in that case, we'd be left with these funky legs trailing behind, which, as mentioned, we don't see. But there is good precedence for assuming this foundation type. During the Niigata earthquake of 1964, where thousands of homes were damaged, several concrete apartment buildings sunk or listed within the sandy surface soils, in part due to these shallow, continuous footings which became exposed in some of the worst cases. This occurred due to soil liquefaction, or the tendency for a soil to lose bearing capacity and behave more like a liquid under certain conditions, usually with induced vibrations. And this earthquake was a prime example for the phenomena. I mean, clearly though, this foundation type tried to float, uh, on land at least. But a second foundation type that could have functioned well in this scenario is a raft foundation, which <laughs> I, I know I, I could have jumped right to this structure type, but if I just came out and said the floating building has a raft foundation, <laughs> would you have taken that seriously? Anyways, a raft foundation works similarly to the continuous shallow footing in that it disperses the loads horizontally to engage a large surface area and is usually designed to be stiff enough so that minor deviations in soil strength or load patterning don't cause differential movement. I've seen this used for small, lightly loaded buildings, but also heavier structures like libraries and wouldn't be inconceivable for a Donchi apartment. The raft foundation would have a pretty similar resemblance to the structure that were shown in the movie, and the concept of ripping the building from the ground wouldn't require removing the foundation elements as they would probably just come with the building as it's pulled upwards by the buoyant force of the water. Which brings us to the final question, can this building float? Uh, short answer, no, which I hope is unsurprising, that's kind of the point of the movie, it, it, you know, it's engaging in this ridiculous premise, but uh, okay, don't click away quite yet, let's, let's sneak in a bonus question, and in the process, maybe we discuss why the concept as presented can't hold water. So, how can we design a building to float? Now, I've talked a little bit about buoyancy before, but in short, floating requires that the weight of the suspended object be equal to the amount of water displaced, and for that matter, this principle would still apply for buildings rooted in the ground if, say, a flood were to come and water pressure were to build up in the soil. When the height of the water was high enough, and if the building were too well waterproof, you really could get a building up and out of the ground. It, it happened in Nagata with buried tanks. But in order to displace water, we can't really let water in, which <laughs> doorways and windows aren't particularly good at keeping out, at least as they're done in conventional construction. So then, with concrete weighing about two and a half times as much as water, the Danshi would need to enclose a volume of air that much greater than the volume of the structure above, and then some, of course, to account for the weight of furniture and you know, walls and kids running around. So, that said, the Danshi would need a pretty sizable basement to entrap all of that air. Google, do they have basements in Japan? <laughs> 
eh, so not usually. And sure enough, that level of engineering detail isn't shown in the film. But if we really wanted to design this building to float, that's more or less what we would need. But made of concrete? I mean, despite all of the evidence you've ever seen, it is possible for concrete to have little to no cracking, which would otherwise allow water to seep in, though special precautions would likely be needed, probably some belt and suspenders of post-tensioning cables, a concrete mix with a low heat of hydration, and might as well apply a polymer-based waterproofing just to be sure. So then some course calculations rough out that we'd need at least two stories of basements to keep the structure above water, perhaps something in the vein of a hollowed out raft foundation like we mentioned earlier. But even then, well, what would stop the first lateral wave from knocking the Danchi over? For that, the mechanics generally work out that when the center of mass is low enough along the height of the building so that when a tilt is induced, the center of buoyancy or the center of the area below water shifts over enough to counteract the lateral shift in the center of mass. As I say that, and I'm not sure if these are used in ship construction, but maybe a counterbalance of sorts could be used in the case that adding more weight to the foundation to keep the center of gravity low causes a bit of tail chasing, and okay, you know, that's probably a good place to leave off since the question of how the drifting Donchi accelerates uh, seems mostly to be based on vibes. All right, then. So with that, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Adios.